Today we're going to talk about Chapter 8 in the textbook, Thinking and Intelligence. Thinking may be generally described as mental manipulations of the representations of information we encounter in our environment. In other words, thinking is moving around and analyzing the cognitive representations of the outside world and our internal experience. There are a couple of different ways that we may represent information mentally. One is an analog representation as seen in figure A here. That is a physical representation, a physical image of an object. More commonly, we use symbolic representations such as language. Often, we will combine these two types of representations. For example, the maps that we have in our head are mental maps and contain both analog and symbolic representations of the areas that we're thinking about. If you were to consider mentally which of these cities is further west, San Diego, California, or Reno, Nevada, you would probably come up with an answer based on your mental map. However, your answer may or may not be accurate. All of us organize our mental information through the use of schemas. Schemas are those cognitive structures that help us to perceive, organize, and process information. For example, we may have a schema about music. When we use a schema to group things based on shared properties, we create a category about that information. Concepts are those categories of items with shared properties that are organized around a common theme or schema. Schemas are useful in a number of ways, but particularly because they allow us to think efficiently about objects by categorizing them. For example, within the schema of music, we might have two categories, country music instruments and orchestral music instruments. This allows us to take each instrument and put it within a specific category within the schema. The specific knowledge about a particular instance or object within a category is called a concept. For example, a guitar usually has six strings. Some items may actually be members of more than one category. For example, the fiddle slash violin here. In general, there are two models or processes for organizing particular concepts into categories. The prototype model assumes a most typical or prototype of that category and arranges other items hierarchically in terms of how similar they are to the prototype. In contrast, the exemplar model does not organize items into a hierarchy. They are simply all examples of that particular category of interest. Schemas are very useful for organizing our world. Without them, we would have a difficult time noticing similarities. However, they do have drawbacks. One of these is the formation of stereotypes, which are Schemas that assign common characteristics to all members of a particular category. When we consider the term thinking, we're usually talking about three different processes. Reasoning, decision making, and problem solving. With reasoning, we're using some information we have to determine if a particular conclusion is valid or reasonable based on that information. We may do this formally using logical and objective methods, or we may do it informally based on gut instincts. Decision-making 
is the attempt to select the best alternative among several options. For example, would I like chocolate cake or cheesecake after my dinner? Problem solving is attempting to reach a goal by surmounting particular obstacles. Much of the time we use heuristics or rules of thumb to make everyday decisions. And much of the time that's effective. However, there are some built-in biases in these heuristics. The availability heuristic is our tendency to make a decision based on how easily we can think about an example of that event. For example, do you think that it is more likely you'll be killed by a shark or be struck by lightning twice? Which is more likely to kill you, tornadoes or asthma? Which is more common, words that begin with K or words that have K as the third letter? In each case, the second alternative is more common, though we often think the first is because it's easier to think of examples of that. The representativeness heuristic is our tendency to place people or objects in a category if they are similar to the prototype. However, this often ignores base rates, or the actual rate of the characteristic in the population we're studying. Consider a person who is shy, withdrawn, and helpful, but not necessarily concerned with the world of reality. They're also tidy, meek, and detailed, with a passion for order and structure. Is this person more likely to be a librarian or a farmer? The person is a prototypical librarian, However, they are much more likely to be a farmer because in the United States, there are well over 2 million farmers and only about 150,000 librarians. The way information is presented can affect how we perceive that information and make decisions about it. There was a time when one could not use a credit or debit card to pay for gasoline at the pump. When this option first became available, Many service stations advertised in the way that you see in the slide here. That is, they had a particular price and then said, there's a discount if you pay with cash. They could just as easily have framed this as $3.04 per gallon with a five cent penalty for using your credit card. People are more likely to think they're getting a good deal when it's framed in the way you see here. People are also more likely to buy meat that's 75% lean than they are to buy meat that is 25% fat, even though those two are exactly the same. We all like choices. In fact, one of the things that most consumers agree on is that having multiple options at the store is good. However, when we have too many choices, we may be less satisfied with the one that we pick. This is called the paradox of choice. There are two general strategies for approaching this paradox. Maximizers want to have the very best option and tend to be less happy with the one that they choose because they have considered every other option and rejected those. So in effect, they're rejecting some pretty good options. Satisficers tend to be happy with a choice that's good enough. In general, satisficers are happier with the choices they have among many options than our maximizers. There are several different strategies for solving problems. One involves creating sub-goals, as demonstrated here. The rules for this game are that one must move all of the rings from the left peg to the right peg with the following restrictions. Only one ring may be moved at a time, and a larger ring may not be placed on top of a smaller ring. If you follow the solution shown on the right of the slide here, you can see how to solve the problem using a series of seven steps. 
Another strategy is to work backward. Consider the following problem. Water lilies double in area every 24 hours. On the first day of summer, there's only one water lily on the lake. It takes 60 days for the lake to be completely covered in water lilies. How many days does it take for half of the lake to be covered in water lilies? Working backwards, the problem is incredibly easy to solve. Since the water lilies double every day, and the lake is covered on day 60, it was half covered on day 59. Another approach is to find an analogy. An example is pictured here. A surgeon needed to remove a tumor from the stomach of a patient using laser beams. However, the laser beams would destroy any tissue that they passed through. So she remembered a story about a general attacking a fort from multiple areas with only part of his troops. The combined effects of all of these partial troop attacks caused the fortress to fall. As an analogy, she used multiple laser beams and converged them on the tumor so as not to destroy the tissue on the way to the tumor, but to combine all of her forces on the tumor itself. Each of these problem-solving strategies is summarized in Table 8.2. Some mental flexibility may be required to solve some problems. For example, in the problem shown here, the instructions are to draw a line that connects all the dots without lifting the pencil off the page. People have a mental set, which is the tendency to think about problems in the standard way, and often don't recognize that the instructions do not tell you you may not go outside the blue box. By overcoming that mental set, it's easy to solve the problem. Another solution is to overcome functional fixedness, which is our tendency to think of things based on their usual functions. Given the items in the top picture here, your task is to create a candle holder and light the candle, keeping it upright. If you think about the tack box as being a candle holder and use the tacks to hold it to the wall, you can accomplish the task. The term intelligence is probably the most incorrectly and poorly used term in the entire field of psychology. Originally meant to be the ability to use knowledge to reason, make decisions, make sense of events, solve problems, understand ideas, learn quickly, and adapt to the environment, it can be manifest in a number of different ways. The measurement of intelligence owes much to the work of Alfred Binet in France, who developed the first test that came to be used as an intelligence test, though he did not intend it to do so when he created it. He was tasked with identifying children in the French school system who needed extra attention and special instruction. And the test he developed was never intended to be a test of innate intelligence, though eventually it came to be used as such. Another early influence on the idea of intelligence was Charles Spearman who suggested that there is a general intelligence that underlies all kinds of cognitive activities, along with multiple specific intelligences, which are restricted to particular kinds of cognitive tasks. The psychologist Raymond Cattell distinguished between fluid intelligence, which is the ability to process new information rapidly, and crystallized intelligence, which is the intelligence that results from the accumulation of knowledge over time. On average, one's crystallized intelligence increases throughout life 
while fluid intelligence declines from the mid-20s on. Up until the late 70s, for the average person, these two effects balance out. The Harvard psychologist Howard Gardner has suggested that there are multiple types of intelligence, not just the traditional ones that we study. While Robert Sternberg, who developed his theory while at Yale, suggests there are three types of intelligence. Analytical intelligence, which standard tests measure. Creative intelligence, which is the ability to solve novel problems. And practical intelligence, which is our ability to deal with everyday tasks, sometimes known as street smarts. Emotional intelligence refers to our ability to understand and manage our emotions, as well as to recognize other people's emotions and their emotional language. The various types of intelligence are summarized in Table 8.3. Like many other human traits and abilities, intelligence has both genetic and environmental influences. Identical twins tend to be more similar in intelligence than other siblings, suggesting a genetic component, while environmental factors such as nutrition, prenatal environment, and experiences in childhood explain most of the rest of the variability in intelligence. On average, most studies show about half of the differences in intelligence are due to genetics and half due to environmental factors. One of the environmental factors associated with differences in intelligence test scores is birth weight. Low birth weight is a risk factor for a number of developmental problems, including lower scores on IQ tests. To understand how intelligence is measured, we need to know a little bit about psychological tests in general. Two components are critical to determining how useful a test is. Reliability is the degree of consistency of scores for a given test. That is, does it give the same score to the same individual each time you use it? Validity is how well the psychometric test measures what it's intended to measure. A test may have fantastic reliability and terrible validity. If I have a bathroom scale and I get up every morning and it tells me that I weigh 140 pounds, it is perfectly reliable but it is completely invalid. I weigh nowhere near 140 pounds these days. We can also differentiate between achievement tests and aptitude tests, though there is some overlap. Achievement tests are designed to study what you have learned. Aptitude tests are designed to study what you can learn. Intelligence tests started with Binet's original test in 1904. In 1919, Lewis Terman, a psychologist at Stanford, adapted Binet's test and renamed it the Stanford Binet. Today, the Stanford Binet is still used, but more commonly is the Weschler test. In particular for adults, the Weschler Adult Intelligence Scale, which premiered in 1939 and has been updated multiple times since. For children, intelligence was originally measured by calculating a mental age, in other words, how does this child compare to typical children of a particular age? That is, if you can do what a six-year-old can do on average, you have a mental age of six. This mental age was divided by chronological age, your actual age, and multiplied by 100 to get rid of decimals. So that a six-year-old who could do what a 12-year-old could do would have a mental age of 12 and a chronological age of 6, giving them an IQ of 200. However, this does not work well once one passes childhood. 
a 20-year-old who can do what an 80-year-old can do does not have an IQ of 400. For adults, IQ scores are plotted along a normal curve such that the average individual has an IQ of 100 and 95% of people have an IQ between 70 and 130. One of the major criticisms of intelligence tests is that they are biased towards a Western culture and the particular values in that culture. And so some attempts have been made to develop culture fair or even culture free tests, though progress has been slow in this area. Savants are individuals with less than average intellectual capacity in most domains, but incredible skills in one particular area, such as Kim Peek, the individual who was the inspiration for the movie Rain Man. One of the most important findings in the study of testing is the idea of stereotype threat developed by the psychologist Claude Steele at Stanford. What Steele found is that groups who have been stereotyped tend to perform worse than non-stereotype groups when they know they are being evaluated on a characteristic that the stereotype says they're not very good at. When you use the same test and evaluate people without telling them that it measures a characteristic that they are supposed to be poor at, according to the stereotype, they do just as well as the non-stereotyped group. This suggests that any group differences based on race, gender, etc. are really due to people's anxiety about being stereotyped. We know that anxiety interferes with cognitive performance in a significant way. I hope that you've enjoyed this week's lecture, and I look forward to seeing you next week.